Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I'm just going to allow everyone just to come through the waiting room, just get them everything sorted. So just, just bear with us for a minute or so. I still see the number just going up a few more. So we're just gonna just gonna hold off a just a minute or so just so people can get themselves prepared, settle in, get comfortable, make sure you're all happy for the next hour or so. Perfect. Is there anyone else in the waiting room, Anne? Are you aware of? Everyone coming through nicely. Perfect. Right. Shall we make a start? If anyone arrives the next minute or so, all they're going to miss is um a little bit about me, and they're not here here to hear about me. Um. So first of all, good morning and uh, welcome to this morning's webinar on how to not pay any tax when ex sorry, how to not pay any tax when exporting through France. Um, for those who don't know me, my name is Ben McDonald and I am the events and training manager at Hampshire Chamber of Commerce. Today, I'm joined by our international trade manager, Jacqueline Highmore, and also the team from RM Boulanger. I hope I didn't abuse that. I hope I got that right. Um, firstly, a little bit of housekeeping. If you could just keep your microphones off, you'll see you already have your cameras off. And if you do have any questions, just please drop them into the Q&A box. If you can be as specific as possible, it will just help the team um, make sure we get the right answers over to you. Anything we don't pick up today, we will come back to you after the, the webinar and we'll make sure we get the answers out to you. So enough from me. Over to uh, my colleague, Jackie, who will just give you a little bit of an update on the, the Hampshire Chamber, what we do and how we can support you. So, Jackie, over to yourself. Thank you very much. Um, good morning. Uh, yeah, my name's Jackie. I'm the International Trade Manager based at Hampshire Chamber of Commerce. Um, I'm really pleased that many of you have been able to join us for this morning's webinar. Just before we move over um, to the team, I just wanted to run through very quickly some of the services that are available to you to help you on your export journey. Um, my team um, is based, uh, we have a team based in Fairham and Basingstoke. And um, a couple of the services, the APA Carne. So this is a temporary movement document that's valid for 12 months. It's, um, it covers over 73 countries, including all those of the uh, EU. Um, and it's, it's raised so that you can move goods temporarily um, overseas for things like exhibitions, trade fairs, taking commercial samples or professional equipment. The idea is that you, you, you show the document as you cross the border and they see that it's the carne and they recognise um, that the goods are only there on a temporary, uh, for a temporary period um, and therefore it saves pay, posting bonds and duties. So that's a very um, important and very busy document at the moment, the ATA carne, especially with the EU. Another document that we're involved with is the UK Certificate of Origin. Um, this confirms the non-preferential origin of your goods and can be raised for multiple origins to pretty much any country overseas. Um, it's not a financial document, um, so therefore just confirms the non-preferential origin. The UK EUR1 Movement Certificate is a document that we issue on behalf of HM Revenue and Customs. And this is issued for UK preferential origin goods only. And it can be required when the UK has trade agreements in place with overseas countries. Um, it can get your goods in at a reduced or zero rate of duty. We also offer um, a portfolio of international trade workshops ranging from the basic understanding export through to agents and distributors and all the lovely stuff in between. Uh, we work with an external provider to offer those workshops. Um, as of last year, we became a customs uh, brokerage service, so part of the accredited Chamber of Commerce network. We are also Chamber Customs, and we can submit your import and export declarations to HMRC for your movements in and out of the uh, UK. We also, as part of the accredited network, have a global network of chambers overseas, over 50 uh, chambers overseas. And they can help us with inquiries with regard to you know, market entry and competitors and challenges, opportunities. 
Um, so um, it's well worth if you've got any questions or you're looking to, to trade overseas in a new market to give us a call. Next slide, please. Um, and finally, this is uh, who we are and where to find us. We've got some really, um, I would say, better images, certainly of myself, younger, um, in this slide. There's myself, Stacey, David, um, Ellie, Wendy, and Ben Applin. Um, website address is there, our contact number is there, and we recently moved to the campus of Fairham College because as of uh, March, April time, we will become part of the business hub. So those are our contact details. If you've got any questions with regard to anything that I've mentioned, please don't hesitate to make contact with myself or the team. Um, that's it from me. I'm now going to hand you over to Michael and Arthur to carry on with the webinar. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jackie, and um, good morning, everyone. We are very, very happy to be um, with you uh, today to run this webinar uh, that will be dedicated about how not to pay any import VAT when exporting through France. Um, uh, I'm one of the speakers uh, today. Um, I would like to introduce you to uh, our friend Arthur. Um, who is definitely uh, uh, a very uh, uh, important person in the VAT world, and you will uh, understand how uh, he will be able to, to help you importing your goods uh, into the EU from a VAT perspective. Uh, on the other side of the channel, uh, we have uh, our other friend, Alan Vincent, our uh, UK sales manager. Uh, good morning, Alan, how are you? Good morning. Very good, sir. Very good. Uh, looking forward to sharing some knowledge with this fine bunch of people. All right. So our, our company um, is uh, established in France, in the very north of France, uh, along the Belgian border. Uh, so we uh, are based around at around 150 kilometers from, from, from Calais. And um, we uh, provide VAT services, VAT representation services, um, uh, for about 40 years now. Uh, our company employs uh, 30 people and uh, uh, we uh, have onboarded a lot of UK companies as new clients uh, since the 1st of January 2021 um, for the reason that you uh, all know. And we reported last year 2.8 billion euros of transactions to uh, the European National Tax Authorities. Um, next slide, please, Anne. Uh, our, our mission uh, in a nutshell is to register companies for VAT and to deal with their VAT declarations. Um, we, our, our mission actually is to help our clients to uh, sell their goods into the EU um, as, if Brexit, as if Brexit did not happen. Um, and our clients uh, with that are able to sell their goods on a DDP basis, and you will see that the DDP will be uh, one of the, the most, will be used the most uh, during this webinar, and um, we hope you will uh, understand that this uh, uh, INCO term uh, can be of great help for your companies importing your goods into, into the EU. We also provide VAT consultancy services and dedicated Brexit services. Um, uh, we will be talking about uh, different customs regime, customs regime 40, 40 and 42. Um, and we also act as uh, an economic operator uh, for UK based companies uh, who sell products that need to have the CE marking uh, on, their, on their labeling. So in a nutshell, we are assisting companies to trade within the EU uh, as if Brexit never happened. Of course it happened, but we tried to, we were trying to, to make it uh, as simple as possible. Anna, would you say a few words about yourself and what, uh, what you could, how, how you can help your, our, our, our guests today? Of course. Uh, nice to see you all or not see you all. Nice for you to see me. I'm not sure how to uh, introduce that in a webinar. Uh, but my name is Alan Vincent uh, and I head up the UK arm of RM Boulanger. Um, joined them in December last year. And my mission Ooh. is to talk to UK companies who are still unsure about how to export into the EU. Uh, I come across a lot of companies that stopped completely 
uh, when Brexit happened um, and haven't done anything in the EU since, even though they had a decent size market before Brexit happened. Um, and that's mainly due to fear and uncertainty and fear of the complexity of, of, of how to do it. But once we find that we have a conversation and we map out your flow of goods, um, we can introduce you a, to a solution that involves getting your customs declarations right on both sides of the channel and making sure that your VAT liabilities are taken care of, then what our customers find is that it's actually a fairly simple and fairly seamless solution to get your products into the EU using France as a single point of entry and then having those goods in free circulation to, do, to be distributed amongst all of your clients right across any of the EU member states. Now. Uh, we have a, a short and a long-term solution uh, to make that happen, um, and we'll, we'll go over some of the details of that uh, as we go through this webinar. Um, but I am here in the UK. Uh, I am available for face-to-face uh, me -face meetings, meetings over, uh, over Teams or Zoom, or just, just a simple phone call to answer any questions that you have. Um, and that's providing a really important bridge between ourselves between here in the UK and uh, our customers in the UK and the offices over there in France. Now, Brexit did happen, and there were a number of bottlenecks that happened with, when Brexit came up. There was the complexity of the customs processes that we didn't know what the process was going to be. It was finalised at the very last minute. Then, then there was introduction of veterinary and sanitary inspections and certification and cytosanitary inspections and all of these things that have come in over time made a, a huge pressure on the supply chain delivery times got extended and people pulled out of the eu because of it that administrative burden that that people had they just thought i'm not doing it i'm going to concentrate on the uk market or concentrate on the market that i know and then in particular as i suggested before there was not enough awareness with regard to the the new vat liabilities whereas people were so used to even last year people were so used to paying the import VAT to the customs brokers and then claiming that back, but waiting six to nine months to get that money back, having that cash flow tied up. Um, all of this has, has now changed from the start of, of this year. Um, so we need to raise awareness now about that fiscal responsibility, about that um, VAT issue. And we need to help people manage that and manage it very carefully. Um, moving on from that, um, and if you thank you very much. So the, there is a uh, the reality of the from a fiscal point of view from the start of this year is that the VAT rules have changed. Um, the French tax authorities have said you are not allowed to pay your customs broker the import VAT anymore. You must pay the French tax authorities. But in order to pay the French tax authorities, you must have a French VAT number. It's the only way you can deal with them. Um, now, there is no money that changes hands anymore. You don't actually pay them an import VAT, but you do have to declare it on a French VAT declaration. So it's a purely paper exercise now. The reverse charge mechanism has been introduced as mandatory in France now. So clearing your goods in France to access the rest of the EU means that that import VAT is no longer payable. And then if you sell your goods on into the rest of the EU, there's no VAT to pay on the sales either. So... B2B transactions are no longer EU harmonized because we are completely out of the EU. Now the transition period is, is over. Um, the customs duties are to be paid in the EU unless, as Jackie mentioned before, you can um, your products qualify as of UK origin, which she can help you with the documentation with that. Um, and then products imported into the UK do trigger that import VAT um, as always but it's whether or not that ties up your cash flow, or whether or not you, you um, pay that. So what we found is that most European clients want their goods delivered on a DDP basis. These VAT changes do not affect you if you're selling DAP into the EU because you're not responsible for the VAT and duties if you're selling on that basis, but your customers are. So if your customer is in Germany and you're wanting to clear the goods in France, they will have to have a French VAT number in order to clear the goods in France. So most of our EU, EU clients and customers of our clients want their goods to be delivered on a DDP basis. So what we do as RMB 
is we map out the flow of your goods. We find out what kind of percentage you've got of B2B sales, B2C sales, even whether you're using a marketplace, whether you're selling on your own website, whether it's a customer to customer transaction, whether you're doing internal sales to branches in the EU, whatever it may be, we sit down, we map it all out, and then we absolutely pinpoint your VAT liabilities all the way down the line, and then bring to you a solution that can map out that whole supply chain for you and hold your hand through the process of that documentation, through the whole supply chain journey to ensure that everything is compliant, everything runs smoothly, and your customers can get their goods in a timely fashion as possible. In that sense, we, we, do, we do make it so that we can ship DDP to the EU as if Brexit did not happen. Michael. Yes, Alan, um, would you mind explaining uh, what DDP means? Of uh, course. For attendees? So, so DDP is delivery duty paid. This is where the UK uh, company or UK entity takes care of the duties in entering the EU and the VAT so that they deliver their goods to their EU customer, whether that's in France or another member of the EU, with all of the duties and all of the VAT, VAT taken care of. So your customer receives their goods at the price they paid, at the price you invoiced, and they then don't have to deal with the customs authorities or the VAT authorities in order to receive those goods. The difference between that and DAP, which is delivery at place, means that as soon as the goods enter the EU, it is your European, your EU customer that is responsible for the duties and the VAT. And, the, and that is on their, on, on their plate and they have to deal with it from, from there on in, um, which is a, a complication for them as a, as a customer. We have a, a situation where a customer recently, a UK client had 10 separate EU customers in 10 separate EU countries. And in order for them to deliver on a DAP basis, but clearing the goods in France, each one of those 10 EU, uh, EU customers needed to apply for a French VAT number in order to clear the goods in France. The alternative would be to use T1 documents to get across France and to clear in the goods of uh, in the countries of destination, which is possible, but, but becomes expensive and complicated. So the easier solution from our part, point of view is a DDP solution where the UK company would apply for a single French VAT number, deal with all of the customs and VAT liabilities, clearing the goods in France, and then those goods to be in free circulation to the rest of the EU, servicing those 10 EU customers in 10 different countries on one VAT declaration. So basically, that would mean, Alan, that instead of, well, keeping in mind 10 different interpretations of 10 different customs authorities in 10 different destination states of the European Union, a British company then only needs to understand the process into France with the smart border into Calais and or, or whatever other ports that could be. And so by controlling, well, basically the chain of events from start to end, they also control the fact that everything runs as they want it to be. Is That's basically what you're saying. You're saying that, you know, keep, keep, keep the matters in own hands and make sure that you deliver to the final customer without him putting his nose into the into the flow of good. That's that's basically the solution, isn't it? Complete, completely correct. And um, the French authorities have, have pumped so much money into the border of Calais. I think it's a billion euros. We've got now a smart border. The logistics routes out of Calais are phenomenal to the rest of the EU. And you're absolutely right, Arthur. It means that the UK company has complete control over that movement of goods. We're only dealing with one uh, set of customs uh, authorities, one set of VAT authorities, um, and and no delays. Hopefully, with the might, providing the paperwork is as pristine as we can make it, which we help with all the way through the journey. So no delays at the border, and a better time management of deliveries to e their EU customers across the board. So uh, what France have done is they've tried to make it as attractive as possible for UK companies to enter the EU in one place uh, using using the, the short straits forum, using the, 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 sh the, the shortest crossing from uh, the UK to the EU, and then made it as easy as possible to get those goods out to the rest of the EU. Uh, and it's working really well. Um, another thing that we, we should ins insist on is the fact that uh, being registered for VAT in, in France, will certainly allow you to sell your goods anywhere in the EU through one single 
uh, tax registration, but it would also prevent your company from establishing a company in the EU. Uh, that's a, a question that comes very, very often is, do I need to uh, set up a company in the EU uh, if I'm willing to use the DDP uh, terms? The answer is no. Uh, the answer is no, provided that, of course, your company has no plan to uh, buy or to um, to buy offices or immovable property or to have uh, uh, or to have employees in, in on the in the EU, but most of our clients just have trading operations uh, with the EU. So there's absolutely no requirement uh, to set up a company in the EU. And the good thing about it, it's uh, of course it's it's very important from a cash perspective because there is no um, a chartered accountant to pay, no accounting to behold. But the, the corporate tax remains in, in the UK. So you still pay your corporate tax in the, in the UK, which, uh, which I, I think uh, uh, has a much more uh, beneficial I think so, uh, tax rate yes. than in France. I think so too. You're, you're absolutely right, Michael. And it's the question that comes up all of the time. There has been so much misinformation, rumors, hearsay going on around the, the past couple of years that people do believe People in the UK do believe that you have to set up a bricks and mortar limited company in the EU in order to benefit from this kind of flow of goods. And it absolutely is not true. That French VAT number acts as your, uh, acts almost like it was a French company, but takes care of the VAT liabilities. That's what you need to take care of in the EU. Your corporate tax liabilities is because you're a UK company, as, as Michael said are based in the, in the UK and the, and the, the UK VATMAN wants, the UK tax authorities want that money from you. Great. Thank Great. you very much, Alain. Great. Could we go to the next slide then, uh, Michael, and show them what the changes were on the 1st of January? Absolutely, yes, yeah. Um, so from the 1st of January of, of this year, um, we, we have, some very important new rules. And these rules are about the import VAT deferment that I think you call it- um, Postponed the, VAT accounting, as in they the, call in, it in, in the, the UK. UK. So it, it would be exactly the same system in France. Uh, your goods will not attract any import VAT. So as um, Ellen said, uh, it would just be a paper ex exercise. The import VAT would just need to be reported uh, on your French VAT uh, declarations. However, this process has become mandatory from the 1st of January of this year. It means that um, there is no other way than being registered for VAT in France before you start importing your goods uh, into the EU. Uh, but I, we, we believe that it is a, a, what we call a blessing in disguise uh, because this process um, uh, will take some, some time. VT registration can take uh, from two to three months. Uh, but once your company is registered for VAT, you will be able to import any goods anytime into France or through France without paying any import VAT. That makes a lot of sense from a cash flow perspective. Uh, we could mention that there is currently Another one that was granted by the French tax authorities, ena enabling um, foreign companies to, to, to start importing their goods uh, with no import, with, with no VAT registration, provided that they can justify that they have started to apply for a VAT number. But is, these other ones will be over uh, by the beginning of March. So if your company um, is would be interested in, 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 in importing goods directly into France, then it would be time to start applying for a VAT number. So, Michael, just to confirm on, on that, um, that allowance, that, that transition period, if you like, um, is, does that come to an end at the end of February or is it the end of March? Sorry, I didn't we'll, quite catch that. It, it would be the beginning of March. The beginning, right, okay. Yes, so it's, it, it, it's, more, it's more than time to start applying for a VAT number. So as long as you can prove you have an application in and you're in the process Absolutely. of getting a French VAT number, then you can uh, you can not be liable for that that import VAT as a as a kind of crossover period. Absolutely, perfect. Okay. Next slide. 
So as a result, the VAT on import is no longer payable to your French customs broker because your customs broker would not be able to receive the, that money anymore. Um, and you, you will not be able to sell DDP to our French clients if your company does not, does not have a valid French VAT number, but will be the main condition to start selling on a DDP basis. And uh, there will be no possibility anymore to file a VAT reclaim um, about the, for the, this import VAT uh, for the simple reason that you would not be paying any import VAT anymore. So that would basically mean if you would have paid anyway, that something obviously went wrong because in any exactly. case, you shouldn't be paying any import VAT. Absolutely. So that would be a kind of a, well, control mechanism from, from the side of the exporters that would say, oh, wait a minute, I shouldn't be paying any import VAT. So if I do have to pay it, something went wrong. Absolutely. Right? And your customs broker should be aware about it. I, I, I'm hoping they're aware about, about it because it, 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 it's been quite a massive change yeah. uh, of regulation in, in France. Yeah. Yeah. Would next we go item? to the next slide? Right. So as you said, Michael, this is a blessing in disguise in the sense that, well, it's quite annoying that you have to wait for two, three months. And it is really three months, two or three months. Well, according to our latest figures now for the, uh, for the clients that we have uh, re requested the French VAT number four. Um, but once you get it, as you said, we basically have a situation where we have a, a VAT neutral chain of transactions all along. So first of all, you don't pay any import VAT. Well, you do have the obligation to report it, to file it, just as you, you guys know it in the UK, um, but you don't pay it. So that's, a, that's a good cash flow thing, of, of course. On the other side, as we will see later on in the examples that we'll be giving in the cases, you don't collect any VAT from the other side as well. So basically all your chain of events, your transaction is fully VAT neutral in France, which basically gives you the opportunity to, to, well, to concentrate your financial means on your transactions itself and your commercial activities. But I think um, if, if there is one thing that, that, that lights up in the whole situation is that all these refund procedures are done now. You don't spend your time on that anymore, amassing the documents, sending through the request for refunds for VAT in different countries. You just use France as, a, as an entry point, as a door to the EU, clear your goods. You don't pay any VAT in France and, and so you then forward your goods as an EC delivery, basically, but we will see that later on um, to wherever your client would be based in the EU. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, I think uh, it's also very important to, uh, to remind you that this system is only working on the B2B side of yes. things. So it means that if you're selling on a B2C, then you will need to, to follow some other regulations. And we would be happy to, to tell you about these regulations, but uh, they are even more complex than, than the, the, the B2B ones. Um, so as long as you're selling on a B2B um, side, you will have no VAT to pay and not either on the, on the import side, not on the sales side. So your VAT number will only be a way to report your transactions to a tax authorities because you shouldn't be collecting or paying any VAT actually. And Michael, what now doing, doing in the meanwhile? Because we were talking about the waiting term of two or three months while receiving this VAT number, but what should a company do in the meanwhile? You are talking about allowances, but that are temporary, that end in a couple of days from now, by the end of the, of the month, February, and we are almost at the end of it. Um, is there anything else that we can use as a solution, as a relief for, for our British customers to, to get their goods into the EU? Would you be thinking waiting? about the Regime 42? Maybe, maybe. maybe. Oh. Could, you, could you enlighten me on, uh, on that? Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> uh, <laughs> sorry, Alan, we didn't hear you. So it's almost as if this was rehearsed. Look at that slide. It's beautiful. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, the Regime 42 is another customs regime um, that has been very, very popular from the 1st of January 2021, as uh, a lot of UK-based companies could not import any goods into the EU as they were not registered for VAT. And uh, what we proposed them was to use the so-called regime 4200. And this customs regime allows 
any foreign company to import goods without the need to register for VAT and by using another VAT number, which is a global VAT number, RMB's global VAT number, that's regime 42, zero, zero thing. The only thing about, uh, the only downside about this regime is that it doesn't apply, doesn't work for goods that are sold to French clients. Because one of the main conditions to use the regime 4200 is to ship the goods out of France immediately after the goods are, are being customs cleared. So this regime can be of great help for companies who are not registered for VAT, who would like to keep on importing very quickly into the EU or through France, but for, for those clients would not be based in France. So this solution is absolutely wonderful, provided that you, you don't have any clients in France. Does it answer your question, Arthur? Yes, perfectly. So basically what, what we are saying here is that a VAT registration in many cases is a, is a good thing to think about. And in a mid-long term, we're talking about a couple of months, this will resolve in the end all, all of your challenges and problems. But in the meanwhile, you have a set of other tools such as this, this temporary relief, relief measures of the French tax authorities or the regime 42 to get your goods into the EU anyway while waiting for your VAT number. Now, if I understand it right, the clients are then using our global VAT number. We as a fiscal representative, as a limited tax representative officially accredited by the French tax authorities, um, but that also means that we are taking a certain part of liability on, on ourselves. So I think I'm guessing, um, and well, I'm not really guessing because I'm doing that for, 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 for four years now, but <laughs> anyway, uh, um, here in that part, I think the documentation is everything. I think having clean documents, having, having a good knowledge of how they exactly should be set up uh, is, is basically what's makes the, the, the whole solution stand or fall. This is the cornerstone of, of our solution, making sure that your documents correspond with the physical movement of your goods. Um, but again, regime 42, no import VAT to be paid. Um, and you're basically performing, again, an EC delivery then from France to Germany or Belgium or whatever your clients would be located in the EU. Um, uh, but that's, thank you very much for this, um, for this detailed explanation. Alan, and Ar Arthur, um, uh, with that, with regard to that documentation, Arthur, are you in a position to help uh, our UK clients with that documentation? Can you can you help them set it up? Can you can you advise them on what they have to do to make that documentation pristine? This has been my life for the last eighteen months now. <laughs> um, I think I think that's that's what I'm dreaming of. Even my children. They, they, they learned quicker how to make an import and an export document and a sales invoice <laughs> than how to read and write and count. Uh, so yes, of course, we will be helping and assisting our clients um, with everything we can uh, from a document point of view. We'll be also assisting them to interpret uh, correctly other documents that are maybe not our responsibility, such as export and import documents. Um, in that sense, we are, we are acting a little bit as, as a, you know, as a, as a middle position that, that holds a bit the communication with, with everybody. We will be explaining the process to the transport company. We will be explaining the, the fiscal process to the, to the customs broker so that he understands why he's using our global VAT number. And that is all um, a very much part of our service. We do it with a smile. Um, and we, it's, it's also in our own interest because if the documents are okay, then we know that our global VAT number is being used correctly and that we don't have an extra liability having a, an open gap of, of, of potential questions that, that the customs could be asking us acting as your global, uh, well, as your limited tax representative. So yes, I think that's, that's the cornerstone of my job description, I would say, um, and it would be with my pleasure to do that. Perfect. Would you be, uh, would you be so kind, Alan, to explain our British friends what then on the next slide they should need um, in order to get things going. Absolutely. Yes, thank you very much. Um, so in order to sell DDP today into the, into the EU, you must have a European EORI number. Now, most UK companies have a GB EORI number. 
but that won't cut it in bringing you your goods into the EU. Your GB EURI number will be used to get your goods out of the UK, but in order to get them into the EU, you need an EU EURI number. Now, some companies, some UK companies have an XI EURI number from the Northern Ireland. Now, technically, this is a European EURI number as it stands at the moment, but because the situation with Northern Ireland is such an ever-changing landscape, and we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, next week, next month, we always advise to get a mainland uh, European EURI number to know that we are future-proofing those exports and we know it's going to be safe all the way down the line. And um, The next thing you need to do under advisement from, from all the governments is to appoint a VAT agent in the country where you're going to clear the goods. That, that tax agent hopefully would be us, would be our own Boulanger. Um, you then need to, ha having that in place, you need to, a customs broker on both sides of the channel the UK customs side, the Hampshire Chamber of Commerce will help you out with Chamber Customs to deal with all of your customs documentation for your exports from the UK. But then you need a French customs broker who knows the Regime 42, who knows the standard uh, import regime, which would be Regime 40, by the way, um, who knows all of the systems and processes and works well with your VAT agent in order to fulfill those import formalities and documentation cleanly to avoid any delays at the border. And um, so getting those things in place, sort of getting those ducks in, in a row and, and knocking them off means that you are fully covered from the goods leaving your premises to the goods arriving at your customers' premises. And as I said earlier, France has made themselves as attractive as they possibly can. That mutual tax reciprocity between the two countries there is no requirement to set up a bank guarantee with the French authorities, whereas perhaps maybe looking at the Netherlands, maybe there would be in their situation. With Germany, there's a different situations and, and different restrictions because each of the EU countries have their own interpretation of EU law and then their own tax laws as well to impose on uh, imports and, and exports. Um, but overall, your VAT compliance costs working in France will be less than they would be if you tried to set up a VAT number in another EU country, which you could do and we can help you with. Um, but for the most part, for 90% of the UK companies that I speak to, setting up in France is the simplest, the most cost efficient and most effective solution um, moving forward. Um, could... Adam, uh, I think we, we could also add that um, uh, the small border uh, is a, is very very efficient. Uh, that France is around forty five kilometers from the British coast, uh, and that makes a lot of sense to to have goods cleared in France and not and avoid the use of T one. Because oh, absolutely, was, yeah, um, exactly what some uh, UK companies tried to do uh, just after Brexit. They believed that it would be it would have been more. Would have been easier to import their goods using T1s, but they had to clear their goods in each country of destination to deal mm -hmm. with each uh, customs administration. Here, um, which means uh, a broker in each country of destination, which means exactly. dealing with the, 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 the authorities in each country of destination, which means clearing the T1s across country, which you know certainly piles up in terms of cost per shipment. It, 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 it absolutely it was it became, it became complicated for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And don't forget the Tower of Babylon, Alan, because then you are ought to speak 10 different languages if clearing at the same time in France, in, in Hungary, in Slovakia, and, and in Germany, and you, you name it, in Bulgaria and Lithuania. So we have also this just a practical bottleneck of, of, of language, mm -hmm. of communication. And it's worth noting that, that the smart border now, for people that don't know, means that providing the documentation is right, all the way through is that your goods clear whilst they're in motion across the channel. This means that your, your, your driver sees a screen with the trailer number on it, sees that that uh, trailer number goes into the green lane. And as they come off the ferry or come off the, the, the Euro, Euro, Euro tunnel train, they go straight into the green lane and don't stop. Nothing to stop, nothing to get checked. They just carry on to their final destination. And that's working for the, the most, uh, the, the largest percentage of goods taken over the border. Um, it's because it's really effective. Um, even with the new GVMS documentation that's been introduced, the smart border is working really smoothly, really well. 
And on the, the odd occasion when you do get an orange light and you have to pull over and you have to make a stop, providing the customs brokers are on top of their game, which, you know, the, the, the French customs brokers that, that we certainly uh, work closely with are, then those checks can be done very quickly and we can get your goods moving very quickly as well. Wonderful. Yes, it's, it even sounds sometimes too good to be true, but it is the reality today. And we are proud that France, who invented once the bureaucracy, is now doing the other movement in the other side again by simplifying things and facilitating British companies to come over to Europe. Absolutely. And that's the message coming from two Belgian guys. Yes, yes, who are not French. <laughs> <of course. laughs> okay, so we, we have 20 minutes left. Yeah. Um, I think we should um, maybe go on with uh, practical cases. Yeah, sure. Yeah, Michael, that would be a good idea. So, okay, so what I'll do is I'll take you through a couple of case studies, which are uh, practical cases for companies um, in the UK. The first one is your company sells only to French businesses. You've got a, a, a French market that you want to tap into. Your customer's based in France. And um, you absolutely have to have a French VAT number. If you're selling on a DDP basis, you must apply for a French VAT number in order to get those goods into France, okay? So that means you benefit from the full import VAT deferments on the imports. You have your own French VAT number, which will also open the rest of the EU for you if you expand at, at, in a, at a later date, if you go into Spain or Germany or wherever, you can still use your French VAT number, but to service your customers in France on a DDP basis, you must have a French VAT number. And as we talked about before, there's those stepping stones to do. You need to appoint a customs broker in France, appoint a tax agent in France, or in Boulanger, are quite good at that. We can do that for you. Um, then you mention your French VAT number on your commercial invoices uh, and your import documentation. And then we report those transactions to the French tax authorities for VAT purposes on a monthly basis. Okay. So that, that gives you open access to all of the EU. It is the most stable and most cost-effective solution for companies exporting their goods from the UK into the EU. However, we do have some other cases that, that provide different complications to us. So if we move on to case two. Uh, this one is much more interesting, isn't it, Alan? Because you, you, here you have a hybrid situation with both the French and the EU-based clients. What would be potential solutions in that then? So we, we get this a lot. You know, people come to me and say, okay, I'll, I, need, I need to uh, uh, service all of my customers across the EU, in France as well. Um, so, uh, and I need to do it next week. You know, I need to send this shipment to Sweden next week. Okay, well, we, we can do that for you. What we suggest then is a, is a long-term solution of having a French VAT number. But while that takes uh, two to three months, possibly three to four months, now there's a, a, a lot of applications in that three to four months, we can, as the, the guys uh, in France mentioned before, use Regime 42, 4200, but we'll shorten it to 42, as a temporary solution to get your goods into the EU and out to your EU clients that aren't in France. That means either telling your French customers to work on a DAP basis for the time being or putting them on hold until you have a French fat number. So using our global VAT number on Regime 42, and it's global in the sense that anyone can use it, but it is a French global VAT number. The goods will still have to enter into France, will clear in France, but then can be shipped directly to any of your customers in anywhere else in the, the EU. And those transactions will go on our VAT return to the French authorities, okay? Still no import VAT to pay. Still no VAT to pay on the on the sales, um, and we can use that situation until your French VAT number becomes registered and everything is in place. Once that happens, we transfer your account over to your own French VAT number, and you work as we've talked about in case one, where you can supply your French customers on a DDP basis and your European customers on a DDP basis using that that single French. Uh, VAT number. This works really well as a short interim solution for companies that, that service all of the EU, but can put their French clients on hold or can put their French clients on a DAP basis for the time being. It may and, be and, 
maybe Alan, that's that's maybe a reason why we could urge uh, our our public now who is listening to us. Um, if you have plans to sell into France on the DDP basis, it's now the time to to get into that registration process for VAT going into France this month, because then at least we can use the relief measures, we can use this temporary allowance so that you don't have to put your, your, your French clients on a DAP basis. You don't have to put your market on hold because a company cannot well afford it. Even if you can afford yourself because you have a booming business, even still, it would be a shame to, to stop your business just because of that. So please do register for a French VAT number up until the end of February. If you know that this is an important market for you, I couldn't, I, I, I can't explain more or better how important and how helpful that would be for you guys to, to be already in that registration process, not having your French VAT number yet, but at least proving that you are in it and, and, and so at least being able to import the DDP um, into France for the time being and, and then waiting to receive your VAT number and then off you go. Um, that's I think right. that's, it, that's a very important thing. I completely, completely agree and, and can't stress enough that it, if you can prove that you're in the process of getting a French VAT number, then we can use this allowance period for you. Uh, and the other thing to note here is that it's really important to know that RMB do all of this reporting for you. We are your tax representatives in country, and we will report to the French tax authorities those transactions that happen in France and those transactions that happen to the rest of the EU as well for VAT and interest VAT purposes. So sales that you've made on your French VAT number uh, will go to other EU uh, countries, is an intra-community sale and needs to be reported on an interest VAT basis as well. And we take care of that for you. That's our job. That's our mission. Now. There are there, there is a third case study that we we can talk about. But let's um, let's first have a look on on what a French VAT number can open for you guys as a company. What what kind of possibilities that could open up for you when having a French VAT number? You can see on the schematic overview now all the types of operations that could be possible. Basically, all kinds of operations. Um, would be possible when having a French VAT number. You could have a warehouse in France. You could you could sell onwards to 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 private individuals even if you'd like. You could sell to to other countries, B two B transactions to other EU member states, or even export uh, again from outside the EU uh, to to outside the EU. I'm thinking about Switzerland, for example, where you would sell to Swiss clients. There are a couple of things to say about exporting as a non-established company, but we can do that in detail, maybe while having a one-to-one face-to-face talk yeah. with you guys, but but basically everything becomes possible. Um, so this schematic overview is not uh, made to, to confuse you, but rather to show you that whatever you could come up with as a potential transaction, um, it becomes a possibility and, and, and everything becomes available for you. Perfect. One remark that I would like to, to, to make is that your goods do not have to come, especially from, from specifically come from the UK. You yeah, could, of course. You could perfectly be importing your goods from, from China, from Asia, from, from wherever, directly to France. Uh, so th this is another possibility for you, maybe to have your goods imported into France or, and have your goods processed in France as well. Uh, and the, 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 the VAT uh, process will be exactly the same. Yes, because Michael, I can believe that if you as a company would first import your goods from China to the UK, pay duties, then again, re-export your goods, pay duties again into France. I mean, that would be a logistic nightmare and, and just cost inefficient, I'm guessing. So yeah. maybe, and we see that with a lot of, of our customers that many of them just end up with having a warehouse, a third party logistics provider into France. And believe, believe me, we do have a lot of space in France still and and we can we can certainly welcome you with it with with space in the warehouse as well. Yeah. We have partners for that, um, so that would definitely be a good a good um, a good solution as well. Absolutely, because the main issue with the exi with the with the customs duties is that once they are paid, they are lost. Yeah, uh, it's just the opposite with VAT. As VAT is supposed to be a, a neutral tax, it means that even when you pay it, you should reclaim it. You should be able to reclaim it, uh, and. Uh, Having goods imported into different countries would make pay would make would make pay you more 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 duties than necessary. So, yeah. 
uh, would be a good option maybe to consider France as your direct country of, of import. Definitely. Perfect. And then we have a third case, maybe quickly, um, Alan, if I may, because that's my favorite one. Um, <laughs> of, so course, I may, of course, I may run through that. We have the case where you have a British company uh, importing to France because France is just a tunnel country, but goods are never destined for French clients. They're destined for Bulgarian clients, um, Swedish clients, Italian clients, and so on. Uh, whatever your European, well, European Union destination would be, France is just then a logical uh, entry point because of the geography, because of logistic efficiency. And so you would use France as a, as a well, a tunnel country, basically an entry point to service your end clients in other EU countries. In that case, you would be basically have, have a choice whether you would register for VNT or not in France. You could use regime 42 in an eternal way saying, well, guys, I, I don't need to be registered. I don't want to have these extra filing obligations, even though they don't have any anything else but filing obligations, but still, I don't want that. Or you could choose uh, to have a French VAT number anyway. Why? Because tomorrow maybe you would have a French client anyway, and then you would be ready in advance um, to, to deliver at once to your French client. So it's basically really a, a choice to be made internally, um, and, and that we can help you with. Um, a downside for the regime 42 part is that you know you you are restricted to only that type of movement um the downside for the vat registration is that then you uh, have to wait for three months um so it's really a choice to make and we are happy to consult you on what choice would fit better to your company i think with that um again said the process is the same customs brokerage export and import into france and outside of the uk we then handle whatever your choice would be your VAT and interest at obligations, whether you would be using our global VAT number or yours. Um, the method is still the same. The documents are still the same. It's just a matter of tweaking and putting the right legal statements on these documents. And with that, we have come to an end of our presentation. Um, I would say we would go to the Q&A and I would yep. like to reintroduce again to our wonderful moderator, Alan, who will be moderating the questions. Alan, the word is yours. Thanks, Arthur. Um, so I'm going to start with a, a question from Tanya, um, which is, is really interesting, and it does bring up uh, an, another addition to, to what we were just talking about. So Tanya said, DD, DDP terms are okay if you're shipping UK origin goods, but if you have imported goods to re-export them, then you may escape the VAT, but you will uh, have paid double duty. Any tips for that? Um, it, it, I mean, it, it all depends on your flow of goods. It depends on what you do to those uh, to those goods when you import them into the UK, Tanya. But there could be a scenario where you have a, a, a manufacturer or a, a supplier in the EU and you want to transfer those goods directly to your customer in another EU member state. Um, now, if you have a French VAT number and you are using that French VAT number to export to the rest of the EU as well, and you're, you're using that, there could be the possibility of using that uh, French VAT number as a triangulation uh, method where you could get your goods uh, purchased in the in the country of manufacture and delivered directly to your customers within the EU, um, escaping those duties and the VAT as well. Um, but but it, it, it is a it, it does depend on your app, your your situation, the specifics of it uh, and whether it's possible. But but the, it, it could be a it could be a solution for you. Anything to add? Thinking about another scenario, Alan, what if the goods are coming from China, for example, and they are temporarily going to the UK because of the logistics part, but in the end, they must end up to France, for example, or to Germany. I am thinking about some of our clients using bonded warehouses in that case. Of course, they're not for free as well. We all know that, but that could be a solution as well. So it depends really from, from where the goods are coming from and where they are going, what, what the time scale is of, of their being paused, if I can say it that way, um, but we definitely can find a solution. And the triangulation is definitely one of the one of the solutions. I think people know it uh, from the past. Um, and just a small remark with that: nothing changed within the European Union. Uh, yeah. Britain left, and it changed everything for Britain. But the rules that we have internally within the EU that you knew in the past are still there. So yes, once having this French VAT number, it can open up again all these exemption rules for you. Okay. So 
depends. I hope that answers your question, Tanya. And, and we, the best way there is to have a conversation and find out your specifics, and then we can introduce a solution to you. And um, Ben's had a question, but from a, a participant that says, my transporter says that they can't ship to France unless we give them a French VAT number. Is this true? And um, no, it's not true. If you're selling on a DAP basis, the the you don't have to give your transporter the French VAT number, but they will have to have a French VAT number at point of clearance, which if it's in France, will be your customer's French VAT number at the other side. Um, so they, they can technically transport it without you giving them a French VAT number that you own, but for that, for the, your customer at the other end, either you have to have a French VAT number to clear the goods in France, or your customer has to have a French VAT number to clear the goods in France. If you're clearing in another country, you're using a T1 to go across to Germany, for example, it's the German VAT number, your customer's German VAT number, or yours, that you will need to provide to your transporter. So again, if you get in touch with us, we can not only give you uh, the, the specifics of that answer, but we can also talk to your transporter and make sure that they understand the rules and they understand that what's necessary and what's not necessary. And we have that conversation on a daily basis. Anything to add to that, Michael, Arthur? Well, I think it's important to just understand what, what the end destination of the goods would be. Regime 42 could also serve in this, in this way. If the, the French uh, VAT number is not needed, if you would be using Regime 42 and the goods must go to Germany, then again, same thing. You would just need your, your number to be able to be the importer of records. And then you have our global VAT number that permits you to do the EC delivery. So it really depends from scenario to scenario. Um, whether they would be needing to receive a French VAT number to clear the goods or not into France, um, as you said. Um, but yes, if in this classical example, it would be a sale to France, then obviously, as you said, Alan, they need to have a French VAT number and preferably it would be yours because then you are controlling the whole situation from start to end. Interestingly, on that, Jackie's had a question that uh, somebody said, I want to take care of the VAT for my customer and ship DDP, but my transporters says that's not possible. I think I you just getting a different should, transporter. <laughs> yeah, you, you really should have a, a word with this transporter, I think, uh, because of course DDP selling DDP is possible. Um, we know that it may seem too too nice to be to be true, uh, but it's working very well, provided that all this. Uh, rules are respected, provided that you appoint a customs broker, provided that you have a French VAT number, provided that we can reconcile your transactions within the EU so that we can report them uh, nicely to the, to, to, to the French tax authorities. But of course, it's working very well. Perfect. Okay. I think we have a last question about the, the e commerce, and I, I, I like this. I like that one. <laughs> I was coming to that at the end. Wait a minute. Just wait a minute. So, oh, I just want to because we, we just have one minute left, actually. But um, actually, we, we we like us to to hand over to you so that you can you can conclude it, or would you like us to to answer last questions? I think we can have this one last one. Ben, what do you think? Okay, yeah, should, should yeah. we go over the? Yeah, why not? All right. So the the. These changes about the import VAT have absolutely no impact on the uh, EU IO, IOSS, the import one-stop shop, as the import one-stop shop is specifically made for companies importing goods to private individuals in the EU. And this is the reason why we, we, we wanted to, uh, to make it very clear that these transactions we've just talked about are only for the B2B uh, transaction. So on the, about the IOSS, I think we should run another webinar about this. Maybe it could last for hours and hours of because <laughs> these regulations are so complicated, uh, but they are of course very interested, but this is really on the B2C side, no, no impact about it. Sure. And very lastly, a quick, very quick question from Jane. Jane said on a practical level, if we sell to Germany, how do you get a logistics company to ship through France rather than direct, possibly through another country's port? That's a relationship, a question you need to have with your logistics company. And you need to either be able to specify that your goods enter into France 
and, and make that part of your contract, or you need to find a, a logistic company that is going to allow you to do that. Or you take care of your own logistics in the in the, the normal standard way. You in, employ a logistics company and tell them the route that, that they need to go. Yeah, and, and this that, is possible for both mixed loads and full loads. It doesn't matter. It's just a matter, as you say, Alan, of doing good agreements and clear agreements with, with, the, with the service providers. And this is where we could step in by explaining them why this is so important. Because, of course, logistics and efficiency in driving and all that, that's very important. But we need to keep in mind the fiscal implications of every step that they do. And so, provided that the logistic partner understands why this is necessary, he would, well, normally gladly then do what is necessary to make sure that everybody is then happy and compliant. Um, Perfect. And that, that is the end of our Q&A and indeed uh, our webinar. Um, really, thank you so much for your attention this morning. Um, we are available for, for you to get in touch with us. Our details are on the screen right now. Please do take a note of them. Um, we are happy to answer any questions that you have, um, no matter how small you may think they are. But let's have a conversation about your specific situation uh, and then we can make sure that we're recommending the correct solution for you and the easiest and most efficient solution for you. Gentlemen, thank you very much. And uh, thank you thank so you. much um, to the entire Chamber of Commerce for uh, inviting us to uh, your webinar. It was a pleasure to, to be here with you today. Thank you. Thank you, Jacqueline. Ben. Yeah, no, thank, thank you very much. Thank you for your time. It's really, really interesting. Thank you very much. And I really hope that everyone that joined has, has, has got something from this. So thank you very much. Yeah, I was just going to reiterate, thank you to everybody who joined us today. Um, anything you guys need, please reach out to myself, Jackie. Um, well, everyone's, everyone's details on the screen. So yeah, take a screenshot, take what you guys need or uh, e email one of us and we'll, we'll put you in touch with, with whoever you guys need to uh, to get your support and to get your answers. So yeah, don't don't hesitate. As Alan said, no matter how small or how stupid it may sound, um, we're here to help you guys. So yeah, please just do reach out. Thank you. Have a lovely day, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. See you soon. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.